Welcome back to our regular Sunday broadcast. Thank you all for being here. Uh, the first thing I would like to say is um, thank you for following me through the Tuesdays and uh, coming back to our Sundays. Welcome to anyone who's new. Um, I broadcast this on Facebook Live and on YouTube. And on YouTube, uh, you can search for my name, Dr. Jeffrey Thompson. Uh, that's how you search for me everywhere. Dr. Jeffrey Thompson in YouTube. Click videos. You can see all the previous broadcasts that go all the way back to April. Um, if you haven't seen them, you should start watching them one at a time from the beginning because each one builds on the, the one before and there's a string of information that weaves through this. Um, in addition, for those who want to follow me on Instagram, that's at Dr. Jeffrey Thompson. Same thing on uh, Facebook, Dr. Jeffrey Thompson. <clears throat> uh, for those who are new, have headphones ready because the soundtracks, particularly that I play at the end, uh, require headphones. It's um, part of how we're doing this global mind link of the people who are currently watching. I think there's over 8,000 now. Um, <clears throat> in addition, the headphones uh, help to entrain the brain waves and to synchronize the right left hemispheres and synchronize everybody's brain waves into a single uh, brain state because we're all listening simultaneously to a single soundtrack with brain entrainment in it. Uh, that being said, um, this time we're talking about um, picking up some loose strings of a variety of the previous broadcasts, things that I mentioned that didn't go all the way through. Um, and while we're at that, I'm going to pop up the address. This is the address where you can uh, get the free download of the music that we will play today at the end. Uh, scientificsounds.com slash loose dash strings. I will uh, put this up also at the end. <clears throat> so the uh, first place I would like to start with loose strings is the, <clears throat> the last time uh, we talked about um, a bit about my own technique, biotuning, uh, and how we use um, specifically tuned sound frequencies to affect a uh, specific organelle inside the hypothalamus in the center of your brain, uh, the anterior hypothalamic nuclei, which is the seat and the center of the vagus nerve, um, or the, the seat and the center of the parasympathetic nervous system, and it eventually comes out of the brainstem as the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve goes down and innervates all the organs along with the sympathetic, parasympathetic and sympathetic uh, drive the entire system. It's the under the hood biocomputer program that tells all systems what to do. And therefore, if that has a problem, any system it controls has a problem. So really, if you follow the route all the way back to the very beginning, to the ultimate program that tells all the systems what to do, if it has a problem, the systems it controls has a problem. So any kind of problem that would happen in my body, it's not their fault. It's the fault of some higher system that's not telling it what to do properly. So that's the kind of approach of using a special version of heart rate variability that I have a patent on that can see sympathetic, parasympathetic live on a computer screen, do some simple tests to see if it's normal function, and if it's not, we can make it return to normal function, this place called homeostasis, where sympathetic, parasympathetic are zeroed out at zero stress, and that's a prerequisite for healing. It's also a prerequisite for finding myself. I have to have my survival needs met, so I'm in an oasis of, of peace safety, zero stress, and now I can explore the deeper regions of my unconscious mind and collective unconscious mind. Um, so one of the things that we've seen from various research projects from around the world who are specifically looking at 
uh, EEG and fMRI studies of what does enlightenment look like? What, where does the brain go? Where does the physiological processes go when we reach these extremely high states of meditation? And over the course of these broadcasts, we've been touching on what that is, that there is no one brain state that is the magic bullet for enlightenment. However, there are a variety of different brain states that show up with different forms of meditation practice that have been uh, developed through various cultures all over the planet. Everybody's got their own doorway to higher consciousness that they have developed. And each is involved with a different kind of brain state that shows up on EEG uh, with specific type of meditation practices. And all of those meditation practices all get you there. <clears throat> That's where I had the concept of the big round God room with a bunch of different doors. And each door is a different type of meditation practice from a a different culture and each of those doors and each of those meditation practices has a specific type of brain frequency associated with it and one of those doors is the perfect door for you um, you wouldn't know which one it is unless you could sort of try them all uh, and that's essentially what I am doing in one aspect of these broadcasts is a smorgasbord of brainwave states running through each and every one of them and exposing us all to those. It's an exercise program for our brains. Each one is exercising a different place that perhaps we've never been to before with brain entrainment and these soundtracks. <clears throat> the bigger picture is the mind link gives us the ability to uh, magnify our consciousness at a collective level synchronize it all together scientifically so that we can open higher doorways of information and experience that no one person would ever have the power to achieve. Only together can we do that. <clears throat> and that can create a quantum tipping point where we can actually change reality itself by consensus, which is what reality is anyway. It's a consensus vote by all of us at a sub subconscious level, a collective unconscious level, that chooses what the next moment is going to be at a quantum field level. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the idea that the autonomic nervous system is the key to uh, healing and the parasympathetic nervous system is the control factor that tells the autonomic nervous system how to work. It's the driving factor. Uh, for instance, when I have a fight or flight response and sympathetic turns on, actually parasympathetic is turning itself off and sympathetic turns on by default. So really the parasympathetic drives the entire system from that organelle inside the center of the brain and eventually comes out and becomes the vagus nerve. <clears throat> and over the last five years <clears throat> there has been more and more research projects that have been uh, showing articles in major scientific magazines <coughs> excuse me that point specifically to a recognition that the vagus nerve and stimulation of the vagus nerve and therefore the autonomic nervous system is truly the key to healing uh, for instance i've got uh, <clears throat> I have a couple of little articles here like um, here we have thermography clinic from ireland the mysterious nerve network that quiets pain and stress and may defeat disease. Science confirms that the vagus nerve is key to well-being and strong immunity. Well, of course, um, strong immunity is what we need right now with the coronavirus. Anything we can do to boost the immune system. We already know that when you're under chronic stress and the sympathetic is on all the time, my immune system is compromised energy is pulled from my immune system and put into my muscles to fight for my life. Same thing with my gut, my digestion, my elimination, higher brain centers in my muscles to fight for my life. This is not a good thing. I'm burning up all my resources. I'm not repairing my systems. Um, so a key to that is to get this homeostasis to come back 
and the sympathetic parasympathetic to rebalance the energy to come back to my reservoir so I can start working on my maintenance list and all the energy goes back into these systems. My immune system is boosted, my gut comes back to normal, now I can digest my food properly. Um, the, uh, uh, the higher brain centers and so when we go and we see articles like this where all of a sudden they're starting to recognize the importance of the vagus nerve and the autonomic nervous system. I mean, excuse me, but I've been doing this now for 40 years um, with sound waves. Here's another one, uh, Crohn's disease and col uh, colitis. Science confirms that the vagus nerve is the key to well-being, a mysterious nerve network that quiets pain and stress. Um, here's another one. Uh, Science confirms that the vagus nerve is the key to well-being. <clears throat> vagus nerve connecting the gut and the brain, a key to well-being. So this one points to another thing that showed up a, f a couple of years ago. Um, more research done into the biome in the gut, the, the, the living um, network of bacteria. Uh, 25,000 bacteria different types so far that we know of. Um, <clears throat> and those bacteria that are down in our gut that help us digest our food, it's becoming more and more obvious that they're also an intimate part of our immune system and an intimate part of our emotional makeup. Now, how does the gut biome these different creatures who live within us as a symbiotic relationship, how are they affecting our mood or our emotions? And the latest articles uh, a couple of years ago were showing that the biome is commuting, communicating directly to the brain through the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve innervates the whole gut and tells it what to do, and <clears throat> receives signals back from that gut. And it turns out that not only is the biome bacteria able to communicate directly to the brain through the vagus nerve, but the vagus nerve is monitoring the biome. It's watching, communicating. There is a communication network between our brain through the vagus nerve to a massive community of foreign alien creatures with different DNA who populate our body in our gut and freely communicate back and forth and each affects the other's function. Uh, and since the vagus nerve into the autonomic nervous system, as I showed before in a previous broadcast, the origin of the vagus nerve in the hypothalamus is hardwired directly into the limbic system and into the hippocampal zone, which is the emotional control centers, and that's how that relationship takes place. Um, <clears throat> vagal pathways for the microbiome, the brain, the brain-gut axis communication, and that's what I'm just talking about. And there's been a series of articles like this, and this is PubMed. This is one of the biggest, most revered medical journals that there are. Um, guts, wits, microbiome, and the vagus nerve. Specific gut microbiome may influence social behaviors via the vagus nerve. Um, <clears throat> a year ago, it was shown and discovered that certain of the biome certain of the bacteria in the biome, specialized ones, actually are able to generate electrical pulses like a neuron. And when they begin to analyze that, those particular uh, bacteria of the biome are directly communicating to the brain through the vagus nerve by generating electrical impulses like brain cells and going straight up into the control centers of the brain and communicating there with electrical activity that looks a lot like brain waves. So it really is a brain gut, brain connection that has hardwired 
right into the uh, emotional control centers. And all of this is how we relate to other people in our world. Um, pretty kind of mind-blowing symbiotic relationship thing going on there. <clears throat> uh, I've been, you know, at this a long time with the idea of uh, expanding consciousness and using sound to, uh, to do that. Sound, light pulses, electromagnetic fields, those are the tools that I use. And when I first moved to California, when I first sold my practice um, in Virginia, moved to California to open up a big center, it was a brain spa, and it was the center for researching this biotuning uh, with EEG, and uh, at that time it was EEG, and then later, years later, it was the heart rate variability. Um, but I had um, a big center, and if you can believe it, that's me, in one of what, uh, what was called the reflection chamber. You sit in this chamber, it's got mirrors on the ceiling, on the walls, and the floor. And uh, up here, these are lights, and there's a control panel in front of me that you can't see that I could control those lights and make them flash at different brainwave speeds. And you would sit in there with headphones on with, well, actually there was speakers all through it anyway, um, with the brainwave entrainment music timed to the lights flashing, and you could see yourself to infinity in all directions. Um, uh, this is me way back then too. Look at that brown hair and everything. Um, <clears throat> Sympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system. Remember the parasympathetic comes from the brainstem um, vagus nerve, and then it comes down and innervates all the organs, and the and it comes from the top and the bottom, the sacral plexus. And the sympathetic comes from the middle, from the thoracic spine, where the nerve roots come out to these postganglionic neurons, which are associated also with chakras. Then it goes to the organs and glands. The vagus nerve is this long nerve that innervates all of this um, down through the gut. <clears throat> Remember, there's a deep connection with the postganglionic neurons and the chakras. So this uh, sympathetic chain and the postganglionic neurons into the chakras associated with each organ. So each chakra has gland, glandular associations, so there is a physical component for each of these. This is the center in the brain of the hypothalamus we talked about, and that's it right there, that zone. This is from uh, what we talked about last time, and the times before when we were talking about the chakras, this is the brow chakra, the pituitary, crown chakra, the pineal, which is in the uh, third ventricle filled with cerebral spinal fluid. So the pineal secretes its hormone into the cerebral spinal fluid, different from all the other um, glands that are associated with chakras. And if we blow this little hypothalamus up and we can see this organelle is the origin of the parasympathetic nervous system and this one is the sympathetic nervous system. Supercosmic nucleus is the body clocks. And all of that is where we balance ourselves out in this homeostasis zone, where the doors open up to our deepest levels of consciousness, where, the he where healing takes place. But deeper than that, where healing of the soul takes place, where we find out why we're here, where we come in contact with higher states of consciousness. <clears throat> um, religion of the future will be a cosmic religion. It should transcend personal God and avoid dogma and theology. Albert Einstein. Uh, those who aspire to the state of yoga should seek the self in inner solitude through meditation with the body and mind controlled they should constantly practice one-pointedness, free from the expectations and attachments to material possessions, the Bhagavad Gita, almost 4,000-year-old texts. Um, Einstein and the Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> um, back when um, I was 
at the uh, California Institute for Human Science, where we were doing a lot of experiments um, to um, measure the immeasurable. It was a graduate school and a research center, and the idea of the research center portion was to use cutting edge present day science to try to figure out how to measure the unmeasurable, chi in the meridians, um, energy fields of the body, uh, chakras, um, and we're, so where we talked in one of the previous episodes about how we use the um, shielded copper room that shielded you from all electromagnetic fields so that we could get a readout of photon counts from the body, from subatomic processes of life itself. And that's where we could see that the, the chakras had 10 times to 100 times more photons coming off those seven zones. So even though you couldn't measure the subtle energy field of the chakra itself, you could measure its effect on subquantum materiality that liberates photons from that interaction. And you could do a measurement of the photon counts. Um, the <clears throat> so the experience at uh, California Institute, the CIHS, was pretty profound. I was on the faculty there for six years and had the opportunity to be associated with other um, faculty staff that were some of the most cutting-edge uh, researchers in the subtle energy fields of the time. Um, Valerie Hunt and William Tiller and Cleve Baxter and a bunch of other people. Cleve Baxter um, became a friend of mine. Um, we used to have long conversations. Um, he's uh, an interesting fellow. The um, go back here. That's Cleve Baxter. He is the father of lie detection. It's the Baxter technique that is used in uh, lie detection techniques all the way back to the 50s with the elaborate chart recorder that records heart rate, respiration, pulse, galvanic skin response, a bunch of other things. These are autonomic, uh, below the hood reactions in the body to the stress of telling a lie and the fear of being caught. And the Baxter technique wove a series of uh, questions uh, that could outfox you if you were trying to defeat the test. So, for instance, there was a series of questions that were neutral questions that should have no response. A certain series of questions that were white lie questions that everybody tells uh, that to show a hiding response. And then out and out questions that were lies to show what that response looked like. And then the killer questions, which were, did you murder so-and-so, um, which would cause a huge obvious response that this part is not in control of, that this part is in control of. So it's the weaving of all these four little avenues of questions back and forth at random that was the Baxter technique and his analysis of all the different parameters that would change in your body of heart rate, respiration, pulse, blood pressure, galvanic skin response. It turns out when you lie, the electrical conductivity of your skin drops and therefore your skin becomes more conductive. So the needle starts to rise, showing that you're having a stress response and you just lied. <clears throat> the, um, uh, but I was interested in him because his class had to do with other work that he was doing and, and famous for. And that was his work uh, with plants. So this big plant here, <clears throat> one day, and that plant was still in his laboratory. His laboratory is right in San Diego, 30 minutes from me. Um, this big plant, it was dying because he forgot to water it. So. He decided to turn it into a scientific experiment by attaching his galvanic skin pads, uh, which is what he's doing right here. There's a little clamp with electrical connectors attaching it to a leaf 
So he's doing it up here, attaching the uh, galvanic skin reading device to the topmost leaf and watching the chart recorder of electrical conduction through the leaf. And so the idea here was, <clears throat> how long does it take for the water to get to the topmost leaf? Here's a nice little experiment. So let's hook a galvanic skin meter to one of the top leaves. And when the water go gets into that leaf, it'll become more conductive. And we should see the needle start to change on the chart recorder. And so while he was hooking the leaf up, he damaged the leaf. And the plant had a full-on stress response on the chart recorder. And of course, this was insane because <clears throat> it doesn't have a nervous system. It doesn't have an autonomic nervous system. It can't have a stress response like that. And he hasn't even watered it yet. So it, it couldn't be more conductivity because there's water is now hitting the leaf because he hasn't even watered it yet. Uh, and besides, it would take time for it would come all the way up the stalk and get into that particular leaf. So this is now a new phenomenon. And it turned into a whole full-blown scientific experiment <clears throat> of hooking this plant up every day and intentionally harming a leaf. Um, and initially he was harming the leaf by burning it or cutting it, you know, uh, and you, you cut the leaf or you burn the leaf and you see this stress response and you don't know what the heck is going on. Uh, but then it became even more weird because he comes in the next day and just thinking about harming the leaf, the plant had a stress response on the chart recorder. Somehow this plant was able to read his intention of harm. Once he had harmed this leaf, the plant now was on alert and was somehow reading his emotional intention of harm. Uh, and it became this thing like, first I have to cut the leaf, then all I have to do is reveal the blade, and then all I have to do is reach in my pocket for the knife, and then all I have to do is think about reaching in my pocket for the knife, and the plan has a response. Um, this uh, eventually became uh, a bestseller book called The Secret Life of Plants, written by these two guys, Peter Tompkins and Christopher Bird, about Cleve Baxter's story, about his work, which made him a very famous guy. Um, the, um, the idea that plants can have a stress response, they can scream when they're, when they're injured, is in itself mind-boggling. The fact that the plant somehow has a way of reading my intention, the electromagnetic fields that come from me when my emotions shift, my intention changes, was double mind-blowing. Um, then he discovered that the plant was now linked to him because when he came back at the end of the day from being out in the town, his assistant was telling him the chart recorder periodically would go crazy as if there was a stress response. And they started to realize that it was responding to him out in the day. Every time he had a stress response, the plant was having a stress response. So they timed it all up. Every time that Cleve would have some stressful event take place during the day, he would note down the time. And when he would come back, they, they would compare notes. Here's when the plant had this thing happen, and here's when it happened to me, and they all started to line up. So this became a whole new, new, new thing. Um, <clears throat> and so this is why I was interested in picking this guy's brains and having a long, long conversation. So I was asking him, well, what are you currently in, into? Uh, I'd like to see your lab. So I went up to his lab. He showed me the plant, and um, I met his assistant, uh, his current work had nothing to do with plants anymore. His current work was working with uh, cells of creatures, and, and particularly human beings. Uh, he was doing experiments with shrimp and other little creatures like that. Uh, but when he got into people, now what, what's happening is he's taking 
uh, living cell scrapings from the inside of your cheek, which has DNA, and putting that in a beaker of saline solution at body temperature so they can stay alive, putting two silver electrodes down into this solution, which now is the galvanic skin meter, galvanic uh, meter that now the what's separating these two silver electrodes is the solution with the cells in it. Uh, so then he would take the person that the cells were from and put them in another part of the building behind a closed door with a camera pointed at them, hook them up to the lie detector machine with a chart recorder. Uh, a camera would be on the beaker with the cells and that would go to a monitor room with a monitor of the cells and a monitor of you in the other room. And then he would push the little red button that would put a low electrical charge through the beaker into the cells and harm them. And you would have a stress response on the chart recorder 350 feet away behind a closed door. So when he's harming your cell here, you're having a response over here. Then he, t uh, and this of course became a new book, The Secret Life of Your Cells, <clears throat> written by a different guy, Robert Stone. <clears throat> but once again, a story about Cleve Baxter and his crazy work. Um, the, I, the, I, and, and then it's kind of, okay, what's the time lag? Let's separate you by 350 miles. Let's put you 350 miles away, hooked up to the chart recorder, and I'm gonna stress the cells out here and time it against the atomic clock in Cheyenne, Wyoming, accurate to one second in 10,000 years, and let's see how long it takes for you to respond. And that's when it was discovered that this is outside of time. It was a synchronicity event. I push, you respond. Which points out a deeper um, reality that we've already been discussing. This, the idea that what appears to be so here in the regular world and the laws that govern this, the Newtonian physics of this world, and the laws that govern the quantum field at the other side of the wall that I described in a previous episode, the wall being the periodic table, where the smallest particle of matter in this universe is an atom, an atom of gold is the smallest particle of gold you can have, and then it's just letters of the alphabet, protons, electrons, and neutrons in different configurations. So everything below that level is the quantum field world, Schrodinger's cat paradox, and Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, and E equals mc squared, and the rest of those, which we discussed at length. Um, so now we've got this thing of how is it possible that my body can have a response distantly to my cell being stressed? That number one. Number two, how can it happen outside of time simultaneously with the event? Really what that's pointing out is the illusion of my body, that there is no place where my body actually begins and actually ends. It's an illusion. I have a universal body, and so do all of us, because this is a interactive hologram. There is only, you know, so, you know, the, um, the student comes to the great teacher, I think I said this before, the, the student comes to the teacher and says, how shall I, as an enlightened person, treat other people? The answer, there are no other people. It's an illusion. It's all me, with a capital M. It's it's the shards. It's God divided into an infinite number of finite pieces and each piece solidified into form to represent one aspect of God's personality. And that's how God witnesses Godhood is through us, through our eyes and our bodies and our noses. And that's why the ancient books like the Veda sh show these pictures of God in God's infinite form with an infinite number of eyes and noses and mouths and bodies and hands and all looking and interacting with each other as this as the way that God interacts with uh, him herself. It's hard to talk about this without gender. Um, and that's we are how God experiences Godhood. Our experience is part of God's experience of Godhood. So um, here we have the idea that 
there is no place where my body starts or ends. It extends infinitely everywhere. It's just that this particular region of my body is where the most densely packed infinite level of standing waves are all stacked on each other harmonically according to the laws of music theory. Harmonic nesting mathematically of infinite number of standing waves from a quantum level all the way out to a cell level. So this looks like a solid, but it's just resonant fields. But those resonance fields don't stop at the edge of my body here. They continue on, but they're in a more rarefied form. This is the ac accumulation area. And Cleve Baxter's experiments prove that, absolutely prove that, that I extend everywhere. Um, and I was saying to him, well, wait a second, I mean, does this happen with anything? I mean, any part of your body? And, and he said, well, anything that's got DNA, I mean, well, what about hair? Uh, yeah, if it's got the root, that's got DNA. What about fingernails? That's alive, that's got DNA. And I'm thinking, so you're telling me that that my, in, my intention of harm, pretty soon I don't have to push the red button to stimulate your cell to have you have a stress response. All I have to do is think about pushing that red button and my intention of harm of your cell causes you to have a response, just like the plant. That means that it's not just my body that's everywhere, my intention is everywhere. Everyone's intention is affecting everyone else. Um, all of us are in this mix together Thus, the idea of if we could gain control of the power of that, we could change the world, we could change each other for the better, we could make things shift. That's the purpose, the idea of the uh, multiple collective unconscious mind link through science with brain entrainment and the soundtrack that we're doing here to shift that. Um, so, you know, it, it's like, well, okay, so if I wanted to hone my intention of harm, then I could take some of your hair, no matter where you are in the world, I could take some of your hair, some of your fingernails, and maybe put it on a doll with your picture on it and stick it with a pin so that I could focus my intention of harm. We're talking about scientific validation of voodoo here. What if we shifted that around? I asked them this question. What if we shift that around? What, what about the power of prayer? What about positive intentions? towards your cell to heal you, right? A circle of healing, a, a prayer circle, right? This has been going on for thousands of years. Um, and he said, that theoretically should work, but I can't measure it because I'm measuring stress. I can't measure healing. I can only measure the stress. So it wasn't for years later, after the heart rate variability thing came to me, that I realized I have the tool for that. The biotuning heart rate variability tool can show me the zero stress response, the non-stress, the healing response. That's specifically what it could do. That means that if you are ill or you have a problem and you're sick and you're out of balance, that if we had your hair and we had some of your body fluids or we had your fingernails or whatever, we could have a prayer circle praying with intention of healing and that should affect you. That should cause homeostasis at a distance through intention. And indeed, there's no reason why I couldn't take your, if we really want to go way out at the edge of all of this, um, let's take your hair and let's take your fingernails and let's put it on my sound table and let's play sound waves through you. Once you come and I find out what your frequency is, you could be any place in the world and you could be getting a biotuning session if I have your body fluids and your hair and your fingernails on my sound table running vibrational frequencies through it that I know causes this. The next step is let's take you in Timbuktu someplace and hook you up to the heart rate variability and then tune your hair and your fingernails 3,000 miles away and see if you have a homeostasis event where you are. Of course it will happen. We know, we know what the game is now. We know how the science works. It's an extrapolation to understand the things that now could take place. Um, uh, let's go back. Um, so that brings us right to the whole quantum theory thing that we've been discussing over 
uh, multiple of these live streams to try to get a sense of the weirdness of the quantum world and how it communicates across the wall of the periodic table to this macro world. Because most of scientists uh, haven't been able to reconcile the fact that the laws in the quantum world are weird and strange and the laws out here seem to be normal. And these weird quantum effects where you can be more than one place at the same time or you can be a living dead cat at the same time until consciousness arrives where time flows forward and backwards uh, and all kinds of other weird effects. You can't know the speed and the location of something at the same time, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Um, those we don't see out here in this world, uh, but that's not true. We do see those things in this world if we look closely enough and do the correct experiment, and Cleve Baxter's experiments is one of the proofs of that. Um, I think the uh, spooky action at a distance where we can have uh, once two um, atomic nuclei or uh, subatomic particles in a quantum realm interact together, from that point on it doesn't matter where they are in the universe, they could be a hundred million light years from each other and they both are in exact synchronicity with each other. What one does, the other one does, outside of time just like the Cleve Baxter experiment where my intention of harming your cell causes you to have a response 350 miles away simultaneous with the event before time. Um, so, uh, if, so now that brings us down to one other aspect that I didn't actually go to. So when I was talking about the Schrodinger cat paradox um, and we were saying that let's take the cat out of the box and let's make the box, the closed box, the next moment from now. And I'm going to arrive at the next moment from now, the lid's going to fly off and consciousness is going to arrive at the scene and what's in the box is an infinite field of all possibilities, not a cat. Anything that could possibly take place in the mind of God is there with an equal footing. Uh, but I don't arrive with a clean slate. I arrive with an expectation that the next moment is going to be my next word and you're going to be listening to it. Because we all believe that we're in this world and we have bodies and, and, and things seem to be regular. And so the, the powerful hypnosis of, of this that seems so solid, um, this illusion that seems so solid, tricks me over and over and over again, moment after moment after moment, to believing, to expecting that this is what's going to be so. So therefore that's what the universe dishes up for me. And uh, that's where I was saying that uh, if you can crack that open and allow your spirit to come free of that, uh, you can have anything you want in the next moment, which is what the mind, mind link thing is all about, and wh which I think is what the um, spontaneous remission is all about. The, the fear of dying from the cancer is powerful enough emotion to crack the armor open so my spirit comes free and decides I don't think I'm going to be the person with cancer who dies. I think I'll step out of that and have a new reality and bang, that's what happens. My expectation shifts, reality shifts with it. There is a field of thought though in the Schrodinger cat paradox that at the moment that I arrive at the next moment, um, all the infinite number of possibilities of anything that could happen, actually all of them, every single one of them comes true and the universe divides into an infinite number of parallel corridors that spread out and each corridor plays out the next moment from now f from an infinite number of possibilities. They all become real. And each one of those leads to a new moment where the universe divides into a new inf infinite number of corridors in each infinite number of corridor. So infinity times infinity, times infinity, moment by moment by moment, forever, begins to stretch your brain out to begin to appreciate what the true magnitude of infinity might even begin to look like. And eternity, where it multiplies itself by itself in an infinite number of corridors, forever, and never stops, and never began. Because why? Because it's nothing, right? The only thing, zero equals zero, remember that? Um, so 
if all of your brain cells aren't fused and blown at this point, um, and perhaps that's the beauty. If they are blown, now you've you've blown you know the the prison open, and your mind can perhaps be free because you cannot possibly figure this stuff out with your brain. It's beyond the brain's ability. And when the brain blows open, the only way that you can encompass these ideas is here, is in the deep part. This part blows away, and this part becomes enlightened in an ability to encompass these ideas fully and completely. Um, and that's when you realize that it's not just me, it's all of us is me. You and me and everyone we've ever met and everybody who's ever come in the past and everybody who will ever come in the future is now, is in this matrix of the deep collective, a symbiote in its finest sense of the word, a symbiotic relationship with yourself. Um, and that's where science goes even more weird <clears throat> into the... Uh, string theory. If we're going to tie up loose strings, that's a good place to go. So in string theory, when we get down to the deepest level of the unconscious field, of the quantum field, where you break the smallest particle of matter open and there's nothing inside except uh, an infinite vibrating field. Something is vibrating, but you can't measure it and it's forming standing waves, nested standing waves. Something is in a state of resonance at the deepest end of the quantum field. And according to this, it's infinitely infinitesimally small strings. And the strings are resonating in all kinds of different modes. An infinite number of ways the string can vibrate forms different patterns, like the sand patterns on the Shaladny plate with the sound going through. <clears throat> so. When we talk about string theory, we're talking about infinitesimally small vibrating strings that when you look at them close enough, they're not strings at all. They're once again standing waves of something that look like strings that are weaving themselves together and forming a matrix that eventually looks solid like you and me. Right back to the most ancient texts on the planet talked about this exact idea that at the core of reality is an idea in the mind of God that becomes manifest as a vibration in the nothingness and it's consciousness itself that is in an infinite number of fields of vibration that weave themselves together into the, the eternal ten-dimensional tapestry of the flying magic carpet that we all hear about. <laughs> you know, where each kind of resonant field that looks like a string has all kinds of different modes of ways of resonating that form different harmonic patterns in the matrix of all vibrational states that form, and it's all you know based on mathematical relationships of string resonances that all obey the laws that we see in music, the laws of octaves and harmonics uh, that we. See. Uh, this is Werner Heisenberg, who came up with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, <clears throat> that you can't measure the speed and the location of an atomic particle at the same time. Your experiment to, that you have to set up to look at the speed makes it impossible to see its location and vice versa. Schrodinger's cat paradox, Einstein's equals mc squared. We, we talked about these before. <clears throat> There's, um, and now that I've spent all this time bringing you up to speed with Heisenberg's uncertainty principle that we can't tell the speed and the location at the same time and Schrodinger's cat paradox, where the cat is living dead cat until you open up the box to look. Now I can tell you a highbrow Mensa joke. So get prepared. Heisenberg and uh, Schrodinger are in a car and they're driving on the highway. Heisenberg is driving. A state trooper pulls them over and he comes up, rolls the window down. He says, 
Hey, buddy, you got any idea how fast you were going? Heisenberg says, uh, no, but I know where I am. And he goes, well, this is suspicious. I mean, who are you guys anyway? What's going on here? Well, you got anything in the back? Pop the trunk. I'm going to look in your car. So they pop the trunk. The cop goes in the back. He looks in there. He says, hey, you got a dead cat back here. And Schrodinger says, well, now we do. Uh, right now I push the button and the crowd starts to laugh, right? That's the end. If we uh, go back to matter, molecules, atoms, the electrons equal one type, type of string and the protons and the neutrons equal quarks and the quarks equal a different type of string. And it spreads out with all kinds of different strings that spin at the bottom level of reality. And this forces it into 10 dimensions, which I won't even try to get into, which is too complex. Um, but the whole thing is based on these mathematical relationships of how strings can resonate in relationship to each other to form chords. And this is the basis of string theory, music theory, the theory that Pythagoras was fooling around with with the sacred monochord um, that we just had a whole uh, session discussion. All of it has got to do with music. You know, material objects, water molecules, well, in particular, water um, is an odd molecule uh, that can, uh, that has a, a form of memory. It memorizes uh, waveforms that can go in. Those waveforms can change the molecular arrangement of water molecules and change the structure of the water in all kinds of various ways. Uh, but once again, uh, the H2O mo molecule where we have the hydrogen uh, splitting out to quarks, splitting out to these strings, and then we have all kinds of different strings which form something called M-theory of all the different types of string resonances, and M-theory uh, supposedly reconciles all of those in a theory of everything, uh, just so that your brain can really stretch out and go crazy. Um, but really, this is string theory. <laughs> Schrodinger's cat and the string. Um, uh, the um, idea that at the core of everything is music, is music theory, begins to give us a hint of why music is so important and why music can be so unimaginably powerful in how it affects our emotions, how it affects the core of us and becomes a new emotional doorway to access the deepest parts of my soul, which at its core is a state that we could describe as an emotional state, but when you're there, it's beyond emotions. When you come back from that place, the emotion is, is awe and love and understanding and a bunch of other things. Um, so really that's the, the core of the idea where we bring all this together, where we bring the type of music that we compose, we put it in 3D so that it seems to be more real because 3D seems to be a core aspect of how my body is designed. The chord arrangements that we use are specific to access specific emotions. And then inside that we modulate the right left 3D stereo field in a way that it causes a pulsation and if we do it just right the pulsation is a brainwave pattern and we can have layers and layers and layers of these pulsations that really form how the brain actually works which is multiple layers of brain activity all going at the same time it's not just one the idea of an alpha state is kind of a misnomer there's never a time when you just have one brain frequency all the brain frequencies are there, but they're in a, a mix of different amplitudes. So really, when we talk about an alpha state, we're talking about a state where a certain frequency of alpha is really, really high amplitude dominant. 
and all the other alpha, beta, and theta, and everything else is down there, but its amplitudes are lower in various ranges. <coughs> this is kind of the work of um, C. Maxwell Cade, who I discussed with the mind mirror EEG device that could show all of the imp all of the brainwave activity across the entire hemisphere on both sides displayed on a screen of right left hemisphere, 15 different brainwave frequencies from beta down to delta. And he was hooking, hooking up um, long-term meditators. He was looking to see what does enlightenment look like on EEG. And he saw one pattern that showed up so many times. He called it the awakened mind pattern. And when I read his book, that changed me because I began to transform my soundtracks into multi-brainwave patterns instead of a single brain frequency. And my first attempt was to reproduce his awakened mind pattern into a brainwave entrainment soundtrack that had 15 layers of binaural beats. And each one of those mimicked the pattern of his EEG. Um, and that is uh, what we're going to listen to today. Um, I uh, eventually redid a, a new Awakened Mind uh, CD set that had two CDs in it, so it was um, two hours of Awakened Mind uh, soundtracks. Um, that became very successful. It went to number 10 in top sales in the U.S. on the Billboard charts, which made me happy as far as my bank account, but it made me more happy because this is what people are spending their money on. People said yes to this, and that gives me hope that it's not just me being some kind of madman off in a corner by myself with these ideas, but it's most of us that think this way. It's, it's most of us who are looking for these answers and who are studying the ancient tests and are interested in this kind of information and this kind of experience. So, so that's uh, pretty much what my soundtrack is today, where all of these field lines of, of the, quote, resonating strings at the core of the quantum field weave themselves together in a matrix, um, you know, uh, a, a matrix of um, frequencies that uh, relate to each other, just like um, you know, a, a, a carpet, which is what these magic carpets are real uh, are about. The, the magic carpets had 2,500 knots per square inch as as different from the street carpets of 90 knots. But the patterns in the warp and the woof and the weaving of the threads that make these fantastical mind-blowing museum quality carpets from around the world. Um, this, this is more of what the secret of the carpets were all about. Um, and so now, um, Let's uh, time for our headphones. This soundtrack lasts for 15 minutes. Uh, so, as usual, um, our purpose is to come together into this space as one mind linked together in order to open doorways of higher perception. And what we're trying to achieve is a vision that comes to us out of this field of what could our world be like if it was perfect. If we can visualize that, if we can come in contact with our soul's desire of what would it look like, if we can flesh that out, we can have that. The universe asks us, what do you want? Tell me and I'll give it to you. But you have to tell me before a thought, without words. You have to form it as a vision in your soul, a yearning, a goal. That's why we're here. So here we go.
<clears throat> Here's the address <clears throat> where you can get this recording. Uh, there's uh, also, as usual, a, a discount if you want to buy that whole album. It's there. There will be a code. Um, so, um, next week uh, will be Sunday, as usual, at 12.30. Um, and we will pick up more loose strings and weave them together. Um, we have a lot. There's a lot of strings to weave together. So that's what the next few episodes will be. Thank you all so much for being here with me. Uh, thank you all for following this for so long. Um, peace and joy and health and happiness. And stay safe, please, until uh, we see you again next time.